You don't believe me? It's big. You know, the General Assembly was upstairs meeting about judgeships. And two more women have been appointed to the Virginia Supreme Court. Woo! Cleo Powell and Elizabeth McClanahan will be serving 12-year terms on the Virginia Supreme Court. So that's good news on a con about at a conference about women in politics. So with no further ado, I'm just going to introduce um, a friend of the Center for Politics and a person that I really admire a lot since coming to Virginia. Um, Governor John Hager, who has served Virginia in so many capacities, I couldn't begin to list them all. Um, but I just know he is a big believer in civic engagement and civic education, and I'm very proud to call him a friend. Governor John Hager. Thank you so much, Meg. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here today. I'm a member of the Board of Advisors of the Center for Politics and uh, uh, have followed these conferences over the years and it's great to see a good turnout and to see all of you here this afternoon. I also have the pleasure of introducing our luncheon speaker and she's a fine public servant and a longtime good friend, uh, lives in Norfolk and was in the real estate business for 30 years before she started into politics. She served in the Virginia House of uh, Delegates from 1996 to 2004, representing Norfolk in the 87th District, and then in 2004 was elected to the United States House of Representatives for in the 109th Congress representing the second district of Virginia, which is New, uh, Norfolk and, and Virginia Beach area. Thelma uh, did a great job up there in Congress. I remember well so many of the activities and uh, uh, things that happened during her tenure. Uh, she later uh, came back to Norfolk, and uh, I, I, I want to go back to her time in Congress. She was Virginia's third female member of Congress after Leslie Byrne, many of you might remember, and Joanne Davis. So Thelma was the third. Uh, she now has serving in Governor Bob McDonald's uh, administration as the Director of Rail and Public Transportation, working hard to improve public transportation in Virginia. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, my good friend Thelma Drake. Thank you, John, and it's um, certainly great for me to be here this afternoon with all of you. I can't think of anything more exciting than to stand up and talk to you after we've just had that great announcement about two more female justices elected. Yay. So I personally like the way that Virginia does it. But thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. And I really want to thank you for your interest in politics. And to see so many of you sitting here, it's just a great thing. Just the other day, I heard a, a kind of a story on the radio that was talking about how less women are serving in public office today. And I was really quite stunned to hear that, although I've thought that by looking at our Virginia General Assembly that the numbers of women are down. Um, and reasons that they gave on the radio were, number one, women are in some pretty great jobs today, and they're making more money than you would make in public office. I mean, look at our House of Delegates, $17,600 a year. So sometimes it's really hard to give up a, a profession or a career for that. Um, or, and you've probably talked about this already today, they really just don't want to be subjected to the tone of campaigns today. And, and I said to someone when I first came in, and thinking about about speaking to you today, I thought, well, at least we don't challenge ourselves to duels anymore. But, <laughs> but we have the new technique, and that's YouTube, that's video cameras in your face, that's um, the impact on your children. And you know, I said to Bobby Scott one day, I saw him at an event, and I was wearing my sunglasses, and he wasn't 
And I said, Bobby, the first thing I did when I lost the election is started wearing my sunglasses again because I have an eye defect and I'm not supposed to go out in the sun without sunglasses. But those four years I served in Congress, if I was out in public, I could not wear sunglasses because that would be the pictures everywhere. It's just that bad. Of, but I made him promise he wouldn't tell my eye doctor. But um, also, and when we talk about impact on children, I will tell you when I lost the race in 2008, right after the race, had two of my grandchildren in the back of the car. They were then six and eight years old. And they were so excited to talk about what does this mean, a new president. They had only known George Bush. They didn't know there were other presidents that came along. <laughs> And um, so we were having this great conversation about our process and how things happen and how exciting this all is. And then I told them that I would not be going back to DC in January. Well, guess what those two little guys did? They sat in my back seat and clapped. <laughs> Right then and there, I thought, well, you know what? I think all of this is OK. Um, but I truly believe that we need more women in public office. But you know, many, um, many just don't think about it. They don't, they don't run simply because they don't know that it's an option. You know, I never had it on my list to run for public office. It never occurred to me to go out and try to do that. And somehow I think we as women limit, women limit ourselves in what our options are. And that's one big message we need to get across is that, and I think younger women today do get it, that it's whatever they want to be. That's what I tell young women today. Anything that you want to be and anything that you work hard enough at, you can do it. One of those little grandsons said to me one day, he said, Grandma, do you think Jonathan and I will ever be professional baseball players? And I said, John, it depends on how hard you want to work at it, because you're both very gifted. But what are you willing to do to make that happen? So he didn't play All-Stars this summer either, so I think that was his decision. But certainly the most asked question that I get is, how did this come about that I ran for office? Why did I run for office? People are just really puzzled by it, which is why I think people just haven't thought through. It's something um, that you can do. I will tell you, I am from a family that very strongly believed that you had to give back. Uh, you were never allowed to be critical if you weren't involved. I must have wanted to criticize a lot because I, I certainly was involved. Uh, when I was a teenager, one of the things our city did, they sent us out one summer with an assignment of all these different streets and intersections. And we had to come back and tell them, was there a stop sign, a, traf a traffic light, or no traffic control at that intersection? To this day, I still wonder, did they really want to know, or were they doing us something to make, giving us something to do to make us feel like we were a part of our community? So I, I've never answered that in my own mind. Um, no one in my family had ever served for public o in public office or run for public office. Since my first run, I do have a brother that ran for a judgeship because they elect them in northern Ohio, and a sister that ran for a city council seat in our hometown. Um, neither one of them won. Uh, both of them are Democrats. I am from a very heavy Democrat family. I just always was a Republican, and in those days, you didn't have to tell your parents where you were. You didn't have to tell your parents where you were. You just had to be home by a certain time. So things were, so they never knew. I, they, they never asked, I never said. And um, so anyway, that was, um, that was part of it. But again, never on my to-do list to serve in public office. I was the mother of two children. I was a very active, as you've heard from John Hager, <laughs> realtor in the Hampton Roads community. And again, very actively involved in our community, whether it was Little League or PTA or Neighborhood Watch or Civic League or something related to the real estate world. You know, just heavily out there. And I was always involved in our party in Norfolk. So one thing that Vance Wilkins, um, when Vance served as our speaker or as our majority leader before we went in the majority, if you were considering running from off for office, you got a visit from Vance Wilkins. And it usually wasn't very pleasant. I know every time he left, I thought, oh my God, thank God he's gone, you know. But um, he would always ask, who do you bring to the table to vote for you besides Republicans? Because there aren't enough Republicans. So he wanted to know that you had roots within the community uh, and your sphere of influence that people would vote for you. 
1993, one day I got a phone call from the chairman of the Norfolk Republican Party, chairwoman, it was a woman, ladies, and she asked me if I would run for the House of Delegates against a 13-year incumbent. Well, she asked me for the reasons I just gave you. You know what we do as realtors, our picture is everywhere, in every magazine, on every business card. I never put them on my signs, but um, so people knew who you were and you had a base of support within the community, and she didn't have to sell me to the party. So often that happens. People pop up who are great candidates who have not been involved, and then all the party regulars are like, well, wait a minute, where did you come from, and what do you think you're going to do? So when she called, my answer to her immediately was no. I don't run for public office, I help other people who do. I will tell you it took me 30 days to think about it, 30 days of very valuable lost time, um, and I decided a couple of things. One, that everyday people have got to be involved in government, because that's who I considered myself to be, just an everyday person um, that was doing what all of us do, raising kids, making a living, all of, all of those things. And that if I didn't run, I would always feel there was something I should have done that I didn't do. So I can't tell you how many times I would be sitting in the speaker's chair of the U.S. House of Representatives, the greatest legislative body in the world, and the thought would go through my mind, what if you had said no in 1993? Now let me tell you, when you are a freshman member of Congress, and you know now there's a whole lot of freshmen, and I'm a little jealous of their schedule, but when I came in, it's those people that you see there in the, in, to up until about midnight when one person is talking to All America, those are freshmen, and we would get assigned, and because I was early in the alphabet, I would always get two weeks out of the year instead of just one, but think of that. What it, what uh, none of this would have ever happened if I had said no in 1993. So what I did, as I do really admire the people that know that they want to serve in office and they set their goals for that and they plan for that, I took my granddaughter's picture, she was about a year and a half old, and I taped it to the dash of my car. And every time I got in that car, I said, I'm doing this for you, Katie. Because I don't think there's anything that motivates women more than the future and the welfare and the good of their children and their grandchildren. And so that was... Uh, in, in 1993, we were a group of volunteers. I wasn't even smart enough, as involved as I've been, because it's so different. I didn't even hire a campaign manager. That was my first mistake that I fixed in 1995. But we were a group of volunteers. We raised $30,000, and we took 47.5% of the vote. Uh, right when this was happening, and we realized that I had lost, someone looked at my son, youngest of my two children, he was 17, and they looked at him and they said, Mark, what do you think? This child looked up, ladies, just like that, and he said, two years from now, all my friends can vote. I said, do you have 487 friends? <laughs> and he said, I will in two years if that's what you need. And just as importantly, the next morning, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, my phone's ringing. And you're exhausted, you're disappointed, you can't even describe the feeling to tell you. Um, it's my son's ear doctor on the phone. Well, he'd had some really serious ear conditions, and here's his ear doctor. And he was our ear doctor because he was the only Republican ear doctor I knew in Norfolk. But um, he's on the phone and he's saying, congratulations, congratulations. And my brain is thinking, oh my God, all of these surgeries and the man can't read. <laughs> but my voice, my mouth, and th that's a real gift, to think it but not say it. Um, my voice said, victory, Dr. Cross. And he starts off, are you kidding? A political unknown from Ocean View takes 47.5% of the vote, this is a victory. That was huge to me in making the decision in 1995 to go ahead and run for office again. And it was a decision as to, because what I was working towards was moving my real estate career to the next level, to that sort of super agent kind of person that you would see. But my goal became to keep my real estate business at the level it was at and to serve um, in public office at the same time. So. Um, Again, after a lot of soul searching, you know, I it was my decision to run. I was the, this, um, John has told you that I was the third woman to serve from Congress, in Congress from Virginia, but I was only the second Republican to represent Norfolk in the House of Delegates since the Civil War. And I was the first one that was reelected. 
The first one served a two-year term. Everybody thought he was a shoe in that very dangerous position to be in. And um, he didn't win his reelection. And I was only the fourth Republican woman to be serving in that session of the um, House of Delegates. And because I was the only Republican woman whose lifestyle career allowed me to be involved with our Republican leadership. So right away, I was put in a leadership role. Um, I became the chairman of what's called the Calendar Committee. You've probably never heard of it. I never heard of it until they asked me to serve on it. But it was ac it's actually a strategy group that continues today that talks about, you know, what are the issues, how do you deal with it on the floor, you know, and how do you bring all of this together. Uh, but what I saw both in Richmond and in D.C. is that our male counterparts really want to know what we think. It was unbelievable to me to see that. In 2005, I was elected as from our freshman class to serve on a group there, which is called Policy Committee. So one day, I was in a meeting with all these male members of Congress, and we're having the discussion about moving to digital TV. The date was January 1. I think the year was going to be 07. It was a couple years away. It might have been 06. But anyway, I'm having this really intense discussion with them because personally I thought any day that we in America wake up and we don't have TV, it is not a good day in America. <laughs> so, so these guys, you know, they're explaining to me sale of the broadband, emergency preparedness, how they need this spectrum. So I said, okay, okay, I get it. You've really got to have it. I said, but can you tell me, don't you think that we could pick a date that there isn't a major football game? <laughs> now, trust me, me, who doesn't even watch football unless my grandson is playing, and I'm the one that's thought of that. And immediately, they're looking at each other, and their mouths are going like this, and they're going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, she's right. The date later became February 17th after the Super Bowl, a year or two later after, after that event. So I, you know, people don't know that that took place, but it makes me feel... <laughs> really, really good about it. And here in Richmond, when I was serving, we had an issue going on that the majority party would not allow a bill to come to the floor. And they kept taking it by every day. And it was a bill that dealt with women's health care and breast cancer issues. So what we did as women, collectively, uh, both parties, all of the women gathered in the center aisle before the start of session. And we're having this big powwow right in the center aisle. Well, you want to make men uncomfortable? Have a whole group of women. <laughs> Let me tell you what, that bill came to the floor that day and it was voted out that day. <laughs> now in 2004, I got another phone call. This time they didn't tell me over the phone what they wanted. They asked me if I would come and talk to them and it was to ask me if I would run for Congress because um, remember that was a very fast decision and a very short run for Congress. It was a 60 day run because Ed Schrock decided he was not gonna continue his campaign. So it was the normal November election cycle, but I became the candidate in very early September and a 60-day run. Um, I became the 203rd woman to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. So I know, think about that. There's about 10,700 just over that number that have served. But of that, um, now you're at about 274 women who have served in that role, which really sounds minimal until you realize we didn't even get to vote till 1920. So that sort of had an impact on that. Except for Wyoming. I thought Wyoming was very advanced. Uh, they actually sent a woman to Congress before 1920. So. Um, uh, it was a remarkable experience to serve in Congress, I have to tell you that, uh, to be engaged in the national debate, to be um, the go-between for all of your constituents and the federal government. That's a primary role that people never think about. You're it. You're how they get what they need and the answers that they need from the federal government to represent our military and our families. The second district of, of and their families, second district of Virginia has the highest number of active duty military of all districts in the nation, and it has all branches of the service with a base within that district. So, um, but the people that I met and the places that I was able to go to, in 2005, I was in, uh, I went on a trip to Israel, and we told Abbas if he wouldn't meet with us, we wouldn't meet with any of his people. We'd already met with Ariel Sharon, and we had met with Benjamin Netanyahu. It was really a fascinating trip. So Abbas decided he would meet with us because we refused to meet with anyone below him. Yay, for us that we said that. So I'm in there with all these male appropriators and everything, and we run out of time before they get to me because I'm the freshman. 
and uh, not because I was a woman, but because I was a freshman. So when the meeting was over, I just walked up to him. I was like this far from a boss, president of Palestine. I'm like this, and he speaks perfect English. And I looked at him and I said, you know, your problem is you're caught in a circle. And he said, I'm caught in a circle? I said, yes, you have no security, so you cannot attract any industry. You have no industry, so you have no jobs. And because you have no jobs, you have no security. You're caught in a circle. He looked at me and he said, oh my gosh, I'm caught in a circle. <laughs> what I've noticed in the last couple years is he has put a new increased emphasis on security. Now, I'm not going to take credit for that, but I hope he remembered that conversation and, um, and, and how that all took place. You know, women can say things men can't say. And we use it to our advantage, men. You're not supposed to be in here, but we do. <laughs> you know, as a realtor, it would be like, oh, is that the furnace? Instead of, I could have probably repaired it, you know. But um, anyway, but people ask, would ask me, was it fun serving in Congress? I want you to know, it's fun serving in Virginia. I mean, if you ever watch them, I think it's the time constraints and how they have to work so intensely for such a short period of time and with those deadlines, they use humor to make everything go quicker. And it's not that they're being disrespectful. It's sort of a way to deal with what they have to deal with. In Congress, it's not like that. But America, it is so important. And, and that was the way I always felt about it. My husband and I always felt like neither one of us served in the military, but we did four years. So just <laughs> sort of our way of looking at it. And what I did realize in Congress, very quickly in my career, is that everyone that's serving there is truly doing it for the right reason. They really want to make a difference. They want to make things better. Whether I agreed with them, disagreed with them, I did believe that they were there for the right reason. And I also believe, my observation is, we all agree on the big picture end result. We all want children to have good education. We want people to have good health care. We want our nation to be safe and secure. We want people to have jobs, and we want businesses to grow and thrive. Where we fight like cats and dogs is what does it take to get there? That's where the fight takes place. It's not in the end result. It's in fighting about that. But I will tell you, Virginia has a much better system. And maybe part of it is the strict timelines that are in place. I used to talk to members in Congress about what I call the Virginia model. And the Virginia model is, if you can't come to a conclusion on something or a compromise, you put people in a room. Sometimes you go in, sometimes you don't. You shut the door and you don't let them out until they have a compromise. That's what we do here. We have to do that here. And it works. But it, that just does not exist in Virginia. Um, I did serve and was quite honored to on a sort of ad hoc little group that formed itself. I was on the Natural Resource Committee at the time, and there were 13 Republicans, 13 Democrats, who came together to create an energy policy for America. This was 2007. And remember, that was a whole debate at the time, because gas had gone so high. We gave up things, they gave up things, and we had a bill that we felt was very good for Virginia. Now, Neil Abercrombie, Democrat from Hawaii, he was now the governor of Hawaii, his job was to get Nancy Pelosi to allow that bill to come to the floor. Neil failed, and we were never able to get the bill to the floor. Controls are just so different, but we knew if we could get it to the floor in the regular process that we would pass that bill. I mean, we, we knew that it just met what people were looking for. Another big difference in D.C. is the committee system. In Virginia, we put our committees to where there would be less conflict so people could attend their committees and not feel like they were missing another. There's still a few conflicts, but not like there used to be. In Washington, everything happens at one time. And then you've got to decide. It's a military um, meeting. I would have been in that ahead of being in, say, education and workforce because of the makeup of the district. So that's a challenge. And I do think Eric Cantor was getting at that this time when they go have gone now to being in Congress some of the time and very set when you're going to be in your district. Because you really have... In Congress, you actually have three full-time jobs. You've got your work in Washington, you've got your work in your home district, and you have your campaign. You're running every two years, and you're raising two to three million dollars or more in order to do that. It is three full-time jobs. That's just the bottom line. But I think women should serve in elected office more than we do today, simply because of the strengths 
that we bring. Uh, think of it, ladies, we multitask very well. Uh, you know, we spend our lives making other people look good and feel good. Think about that. You do everything you can to make your husband, your children, make everybody just look good, build up their egos. We're not usually ego-driven. We're usually results-driven to make sure that something gets done and, um, um, you know, we're more interested in the result. In 1996, another delegate came up to me and he said, will you knock it off? You're making us all look bad. To which I said, I'm simply doing my job, period. That was the end of the discussion. He never said any more about that. Um, women don't seek credit either. You know, we just want it done. We're not interested in standing there saying that we did it. And, and people want to know, this is what the public wants to know, do you care about them? Are you willing to work as hard as you can work? And can they trust you to do the right thing? And that's why women make such good candidates, and it's so hard for men to run against us, because it's a little harder to try to paint a picture about us. Um, in the uh, Republican caucus, you ladies will get a kick out of this, it was right after the Mark Foley thing happened, and then we had this guy from New York, I can't even remember his name, um, remember he got a DUI and he shows up at the police station, gets bailed out by a woman that nobody knows who she is. Well, it turns out she's his mistress and has a child. So one of our ladies stood up on the house, in, not in the House caucus, Republican caucus, not on the floor, and she told those men, she said, let me tell you what, one more thing and none of you ever get to run again. It's going to be all women because we are sick of it. <laughs> Let's hope it made a, a little bit of a difference. But um, anyway, um, I've lost my place, ladies, because I wanted to make, yeah, here I am. I did, I didn't want to forget to tell you this, I read an article just a couple of weeks ago about the difference between men and women serving, and I should have cut it out, but it was a national article that really said all the things that I say about women, that we're results oriented, that we don't want the credit, that we tend to look at it as we, we're just here to get the job done. So one of the things that... Um, does happen is the guys will all go out together. They go out to dinner together, that sort of thing. Women don't tend to do that. And when I was in Congress, I went to the longest serving Republican woman, Nancy Johnson from Connecticut. Guess how they took her out in the next cycle? They convinced the public she was too old. She was 72 years old and the best member of Congress on health care issues. Unbelievable that they would do that to her and did not appear old or elderly or shuffly or any of those sorts of things. But, um, but so Nancy and I started monthly Republican women dinners and, um, and, and just sort of a network that we could contact each other because it's not something we do naturally like guys do. But certainly as a realtor and a profession that's dominated by women, I never expected to be treated any differently than a man. Because that's where I came from. That was my background. Nobody treated me differently. They wanted those real estate contracts that I'd written and uh, wanted to see those results. But um, I would frequently get press calls where they would say, what's it like to be a woman in the House of Delegates? Um, right now, there are 91, 91, 91 women serving in the U.S. Congress out of 535. And that breakdown is 75 in the House and 17 in the Senate. So there's a lot of opportunity is what I'm trying to sell you, to tell you women, we outnumber men by 4 million. We outvote them 65% to 62%. Why do you think your vote's so important and why everybody is hounding you to find out? And people would always come up to me and say, oh, well, you're just going to get the women vote. You know what, ladies? We don't vote for candidates because they're women. We vote for candidates because they agree with our political philosophies and, and our thinking and that we think they're the right person for the job. So I don't know where people get that sort of thing is that women vote for women because you really have to earn our vote, period. Um, in the 2008-2009 school year, women took 58% of the bachelor degrees. So, you know, we are, we are making real progress here. And we're now at about 14% serving in the armed service, up from 2% in 1950. So a lot, of, a lot of opportunities there for us. And this is an interesting one, too. In the 10-year period from 1997 to 2007, we went from 4.6 million to 5.6 million women who have chosen to be stay-at-home moms. 
see that women are freer to do what they want to do. I have a very dear friend, my age, her kids are my age, and she was a stay-at-home mom, and she used to always be assaulted in the grocery store by people who would say, oh, I can't believe you don't work. How outrageous is that? She's doing the most important thing. She can work when her kids grow up. How fortunate for her that she didn't have to do that. I believe that we as women can have anything that we want. But the problem is we can't have it all at once. So you've got to sort of plan out how you're going to make that happen. Um, but, you know, you have to de make decisions, you have to plan, you have to decide how that's going to work in your life. And I think it's important for each of us to remember that every single one of us can make a difference. Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of his definitions of success is to know that you have touched someone's life and made a difference. So whether it's by serving nationally or whether it's locally or whether it's just within your own communities, remember that you can make a difference in someone's life and always believe that you can do it. You know, when I went into real estate, and I'll tell you, I was newly divorced, had two children, had no income, decided if I didn't have a sale within 90 days, I was going to work in 7-Eleven at night because I was going to be a realtor and I was going to do very, very well. That was my mindset. It never occurred to me. Unlike the um, 88th day, I had four contracts in place. So that had just happened within that last week, and I never went to work in 7-Eleven. Just want to make sure you know that. But you just you have to believe you can. And new agents would come up to me, and they would say, oh, I know I could never do what you do. And I would look at them and say, you know, you probably can't because you don't believe that you can. You've got to decide that you can. You know, start doing the easy things. Watch what people do. Watch what they say. Watch what they wear. How do they deal with people? What kind of car does they drive? I went to look at the most successful agents in our company to find out what were they doing because that's what I was going to do. I wasn't going to wear flip-flops and culottes. Do you guys remember that name? But I actually saw agents that did that sort of thing. But those weren't the ones that I was going to model after. It's going to be the guys that I knew did very well. Um, we have to encourage other women to do the same thing. We have to encourage ourselves. And I think the most important thing for me as a realtor, and, and I took it through life, my first campaign, I ran it like my real estate. I had to make 100 phone calls a day in real estate to ask people if they wanted to buy or sell houses. So I did that, 100 phone calls a day. Will you vote for me? You know, I would never dealt with rejection because I was always so used to it. But, um, <laughs> but you know, you set your goals, write them down. Uh, I put a picture of a Volvo on the wall. I drove Volvos for 24 years, just stopped because of the price of gas. You know, I don't want to put premium in anymore. But um, so it's amazing what we do over things like that. Have visuals. So I, when I first went to the company I was with, they were sending people on a trip to. Um, the Bahamas. Well, I'd never been to the Bahamas. The only place I'd ever been is Canada, because my, half my family's Canadian. And so I knew next year I was going to the Bahamas. Well, I walked into that hotel room. It was the Princess, if you've ever been there. It's the gambling casino. And I said, I want a room that's got an ocean view. And they looked at me and said, we're not on the ocean. <laughs> They're actually a bit of a distance from the ocean, but, but I had that goal and I made it. Now, you know, you have to tell yourself, you might need to be a little more specific. But, and always remember, ladies, one of our challenges as women is there is just not enough time in the day. There is no more time in the day. I used to go to all these time management classes when I was in real estate because there wasn't enough time in the day. And one day it hit me like a brick. There is no more time in the day. You have to hire people to do things because there is no more time. And my time was not well spent talking to attorneys and mortgage companies. My time was well spent with buyers and sellers. So I was one of the very first in our market that hired an assistant. I hired a full-time ass uh, assistant in 1986. It's sort of the norm today. I doubled my volume that year just by having someone do the stuff that didn't matter. You know, so, or, I mean, it matters, but it shouldn't be how you're spending your time. And remember, too, time goes too quickly. All of you as parents know that. That's why God gives us grandchildren, to let us sort of make up for it. And what I did, I made everything an appointment. And my assistant was only allowed to say she's on an appointment. She was never allowed to say what the appointment was. It could have been the grocery store. It could have been a Little League game. It could have been a PTA meeting. It was an appointment. It was in my calendar, and it was done. Now, I was fortunate because as a realtor, you could control your time a lot more than if you're working 9 to 5 in somebody's office. So it really was uh, the two sort of um, meshed together. And I will tell you that women in Congress joke 
that they wish they had a wife. Yeah. Um, and and I, I will tell you, I thank my husband all the time because I could not have done what I did without his support, without him taking a lot of responsibility off of me. You know, I used to pay all the bills and do all those sorts of things. I, knew, I did a lot handling our rental. Um, I don't even know who our tenants are now. Or he'll talk about some property by the street number. I have no idea what he's talking about. So it's really great. And I have not gone back to taking that responsibility. But, uh, but trust me, I am never going to let him cook Thanksgiving dinner, and he is never going to do the Christmas shopping. So, you know, there's still a lot of things that fall on our shoulders anyway. People often ask me if I'm going to run again, and my answer is, you know, I've made a four-year commitment to the governor. I've made a four-year commitment to our staff at DRPT, because what I didn't know about state employees until I got there, number one, I always sort of had that impression that they didn't do a whole lot. These are the hardest working people I have ever seen. And not only are they hard working, they base everything on them being a taxpayer. And is that a wise use of their taxpayer dollars? I was blown away. It was unbelievable what the public thinks and how things really work. But what I said to them right away is how difficult it must be to every four years, you could have a totally different direction for your agency. I mean, our governor serves one term. It could be totally different, a totally different director every four years. So I, I think that's very, very difficult. But um, certainly serving in the role I'm in now at Department of Rail and Public Transportation, the relationships that I've made over the last 18 years of serving in public office have just been invaluable, both here in Richmond and in um, Washington. And it's what Sean Connaughton said to me when he offered me the job. I said, you want me to do what? And he said, he said, I have all the professional help I need for rail and transit. He said, I need someone to be their voice, I need someone to be their face, and I need someone to go get them some money. Like, oh, okay, I can do that. So, you know, <laughs> but it's really a good model. Staff loves it, and, and I've learned a whole lot about rail and public transportation. Uh, but understanding the legislative process. You know, we uh, got a budget amendment in, in like less than 24 hours, of the Commonwealth Transportation Board approving our new train service into Norfolk. We got that drawn up and passed uh, during that end of that session by both the House and the Senate to allow us to use some of our existing money to bring up passenger rail. So within the next two years now, we're going to have rail service from Norfolk into Richmond, onto DC, all the way to Boston. First time they've had rail service since 1977. <laughs> Um, and the first time they will ever go Richmond, D.C. route, well, what they had before went to Cincinnati. No wonder it failed. Who wants to go to Cincinnati? <laughs> you know, largest naval base in the world, I don't think they're going there. So, but they're very excited about being able to use that um, to go to the, to the Pentagon. And, and certainly my friendships there, Chairman Micah, Chairman of Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, a couple things I've seen him add in are things that we've talked about over the six months of this year. Uh, things like how difficult the environmental process is. And the public rightly asks, if you're already running trains on a railroad track today, why is it going to take you eight years to go from this environmental level to this environmental level? Makes no sense. And that's part of what he's proposed in his reauthorization is that you would not have to do that on existing right-of-ways. So he may have thought of that himself, or I'm happy to be a little nudge. Um, but certainly, I view transportation as a function of government because it's not something we can do for ourselves. And think about one question. I had an eight-year-old boy in Virginia Beach when I was a member of Congress looked at me and said, if you were in charge of everything, and everything was off the table, but you could only put six things back on, what would they be? What a great challenge, just like that in front of that child. Think about it. Of course, my first was the defense of this nation. My second was transportation. And my third was energy. Because those are things we can't do for ourselves, and we can't survive without them. So those three you know, were real easy. But think about it yourself. If you were in charge of everything, uh, it was interesting to me that education was not one of them because we know how important that is to all of us, but I do think I could educate my children if I had to, or I'd find a way to do it. Um, but the things that, that view that, but, so what we do at DRPT, just to tell you this, is I believe that we're the answer to peak time congestion in single occupant vehicles. Notice it when you're out driving, how many cars just have one person in it? You know, my, hus I, my husband was always one of those that, oh, yeah, look at that bus. It's got one person on it. You know, look, what are you doing sort of thing. But we were going to a football game one day. We live in Ocean View, as you've heard. 
This little guy was playing in Deep Creek. Anybody that knows Hampton Roads knows that's very difficult for a five o'clock game. So I tell Ted how to go. Sneak around the back way, jump up on 64, and I'm like, cut all the way over. You gotta go all the way over. Well, because I tell him how to drive, he does it. So he goes all the way over to the HOV lane and we are just booking it. And he looked at me and he said, well, why are they all over there? I said, Ted, you haven't looked. They are one person in the car. And here we are. Now, it doesn't go all the way to Deep Creek, but we got there before that game started. So I felt like I felt like it was a victory that day. And then he called me up one day. I always talk to him at 7 o'clock in the morning if I've stayed up here. And um, it's like 8 o'clock, and he's on the phone, and he's very agitated. And I'm like, oh, my God, something's happened. And he's telling me where he is. I'm thinking, oh, my God, our friend's house is on fire. I, I mean, that's how he sounds. What he was telling me is that there were 50 cars backed up on Granby Street to turn into the Naval Air Station, and only two of them had more than one person in the car. So I went, yay! Somebody is paying attention. But think of the assets that Virginia has invested in, these beautiful roads. Go out and drive around at 3 o'clock in the morning. We have beautiful assets. Now, I always taught my children nothing good happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, but go out and drive around and look at our assets and then look at them between 7 and 9 in the morning. So how do we maximize the use of those assets? And the answer is public transportation. It's the other, one of our other components are things like carpools, van pools, telework, and then, of course, rail, both freight and passengers. So if we want to maximize it, bring things up quickly, that's a way that we're able to do it. And, you know, I didn't know in 1993 where things were going to go for me, just like you didn't know what would happen in your life and you'd be sitting in this room in 1993 and, and how things would take a turn. But I'm certainly grateful that uh, Mary Greg called me and asked me to run for office and that we, with the help of a lot of friends, were able to make that happen and to have the absolutely remarkable experiences that I've so I'm just encouraging you, and I didn't say it yet, but we as women need to be mentors for one another, and we need to help each other. And I was fortunate to have a wonderful mentor in my life. Uh, she's no longer with us, but this is one of the things that she gave me over the years. And I thought, you know, Joan, I'm going to wear that for you when I go and speak to all these ladies.